Hi, everybody. Uh, happy to be here with the Illinois Arborist Association. Uh, I'm Kevin Rowling, a uh, forestry research technician with the University of Illinois Extension Forestry um, out of uh, Dixon Springs Agricultural Center in southernmost Illinois. Uh, so today I'm going to talk with you about some of the wildlife benefits of native shrubs and uh, hopefully uh, get everyone to uh, jump on board with um, using more native plants um, landscaping areas and uh, just using them actually in any type of area. Um, before we get into the specific species, just want to go over some of the things you might uh, need to consider uh, before making your decision on, on which shrubs you would use. Uh, of course, we have the these uh, kind of broad general uh, characteristics. Um, Dr. Miller was um, talking to some extent on uh, the impact of soils and climate and weather and all of those things. Of course, those are all things that we need to take into account. Um, and then there's the aesthetics um, and uh, preferences of either yourself or your clients. And of course, the topic of this talk, uh, the wildlife value. So, um, if you've been paying attention over the last couple of years, there have been studies that have come out showing really huge declines in songbirds and, and insects, pollinators in particular. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for those declines, of course, but uh, one of the one of the big ones is habitat loss. And uh, in using native shrubs and other native plants um, in more urban areas and landscaping, uh, we can hopefully start to combat some of those some of those declines. And I probably don't have to tell any of you, but Illinois is quite diverse, as Dr. Miller's uh, talk pointed out. Um, pretty significant differences depending on which region. Uh, you're in in Illinois, um, both climatically and uh, uh, soil wise. Um, of course, you wanna take into account uh, the hardiness zones uh, for the plants that you're looking into using. And I wanted to mention before we jump into species as well, um, <clears throat> a couple of online resources that I find really useful. Many of you are probably familiar with this first one, the, the web soil survey, but if, you, if you're not familiar, I encourage you to check it out. Um, basically, this uh, website um, will generate custom soil reports for your site, um, and it's relatively straightforward. Um, I'm sure you can find YouTube videos of how to go through it. Um, but just to give you an example of the type of report that it would generate, just looking at this residential yard, um, you can basically draw a polygon around your area of interest, in this case, this yard, um, and it will tell you what the soil type is, basically. And in this case, there is uh, pretty uniform soils. Uh, it's a smaller area, uh, pretty flat. Uh, you can see right there in the middle that 376A is the lone soil type uh, at this site. So um, once you get to that point, you can generate the soil report. And uh, you can see here a couple of the highlights from that report. And then you can, from that report, look up the soil series um, that you have on site and gain some additional information about the soils. Now, this is kind of a broad strokes, maybe the broadest stroke uh, you can have uh, for trying to determine some of the soil characteristics of your site. Of course, there are a number of testing options available to you to get more specific. But um, as we all know, uh, the pH, of course, um, is a significant factor among other other soil characteristics. So in this case, looking at this uh, soil type, it was a Cisne silt foam uh, at a relatively low uh, slope. And um, I just kind of circled 
uh, some of these um, uh, highlighted um, characteristics that might be important to look at. Hey, Kevin, now that you've gotten into this, you're actually presenting, or we can see your presenter mode, not the slide mode. Oh, shoot. <laughs> really, really hard to see. Oh, no. Thank yeah. you for, for pointing that out. Did that change it? Not yet, but there might be a lag. Yep, there we go. Great. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so anyway, uh, once you go to the um, the look up the soil type there from the uh, official series description, in this case, this is knee silt loam. Um, one of the things that I like to look at here are the um, use in vegetation. Uh, so you can see most of these are used to grow corn, soybeans, and wheat, but then uh, a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, it will also say native vegetation is prairie grasses with some widely spaced trees in place. So that's kind of your first clue about what might do well um, on your site or in that area. Um, and then it also goes on to uh, further describe the soil types. Poorly drained, <laughs> slowly or very slowly permeable soils. And then if you uh, continue on down. It looks at the uh, different layers of the soil, moderately acid acidic, uh, strongly acidic, strongly acidic, strongly acidic. So of course, these are the sorts of things that you're going to want to take into account um, when you're making your initial decisions about what to plant. And I'm a big fan of working with what you've got. Um, so um, just a word about using natives versus using non-natives. I know this can be controversial depending on the crowd, um, but you know, uh, to me, using native species, you're just, there are so many um, pros with using natives and, and basically none of the, the cons of uh, using non-natives. So, uh, you're going to have more greater wildlife use and ability to observe wildlife with native plants. Uh, like I said earlier, um, helping with reversing some of those insect and bird declines. Um, you know that a native plant does not really have much potential to become invasive. Some might disagree with a couple of species here and there. Um, these nectar and pollen resources typically or are more widely used on native plants versus non-native plants. Uh, native plants typically are um, more productive in terms of nesting sites and cover, uh, especially for birds. Um, and of course, the food resource uh, of these plants is going to be um, more useful if it is a native plant versus non-natives in most cases, of course. Um, but thinking about that from that perspective, you, you may or may not need to reframe your thinking of pests. So uh, in a lot of cases, these native shrubs are gonna be um, serving as host plants to um, uh, the caterpillars of our uh, butterflies and moths. So yeah, these, um, these might be considered pests, but they're also serving as um, um, uh, food for uh, different songbirds and, and so on up the food chain, and also just in general, uh, providing uh, for habitat needs of those insects themselves. So uh, another really great resource that I found recently that I wanted to mention uh, is this native plant finder. And you see the um, link there. Uh, but this is really cool. It gives you specific options to your location uh, for native plants that will do well in your area. So you can punch in a specific zip code and it will generate a list of different plants um, that would work for that site. And in addition to that list of uh, the different plants, it also tells you how many different butterflies and moths 
will be using that plant in that location. So um, just kind of looking here at a couple of examples, um, you can see under the trees and shrubs for this zip code, uh, this is here in Southern Illinois, um, out of Marion, uh, you can see kind of there, the top left of that uh, example on the right, there's the oak example. So this is the Quercus genus, but you can also see um, this little number here is the number of butterflies and moths that are gonna be using uh, that genus. So 456 different species uh, in this area alone and so on down the line. So that's like when you hear people talking about how critical, uh, critically important oaks are to preserving um, insect and, and other wildlife, um, this is the big reason why. It's just these plants support so many different things. And if you're not familiar, um, this site is based in part on the work of Doug Talamy and um, his um, pretty groundbreaking work with um, really bringing attention to this issue um, uh, in general um, through his book, Bring Nature Home. And I believe he's come out with another one or two since then, but really great resource. Um, so like, I'm gonna go into a few, a few of the shrubs that are available uh, for uh, across the state, but I definitely encourage you to check this out because there's going to be so many hundreds more uh, options um, than what we can go through in, in a talk like this today. So uh, with that, I'm going to jump into a few examples. Um, right here, we have the common elderberry. So this is a, a deciduous shrub, 4 to 12 feet tall, prefers partial uh, sun to full sun and moist and fertile loamy soil. This is pretty, uh, a pretty generalist species though. It can be pretty forgiving. Um, this is a, a short-lived plant, but it is clonal. So that might be something you'd wanna consider. It will spread out. Um, it has these really nice spring blooms and really um, uh, bold display in the fall um, of the berries. The, the berries themselves are a deep dark purple. I wish I had a picture of those up here, but. I failed. Um, and uh, it's a host to 29 different butterflies and moths, provides nesting sites for a number of bees. So if you're not familiar uh, with elderberry, it has a relatively soft pith. So a lot of these native bees will be able to kind of tunnel into those stems and, and create homes. And in a lot of cases, they'll use um, like last year's growth that may have broken off and they'll be able to climb down into that, that pith from previous uh, year's growth. So if you're able to, uh, you might wanna leave some of those um, old stems behind. Uh, of course, if you'd rather have a, a cleaner appearance, you can, you can always trim those back. Uh, it also provides pollen and uh, food in, from uh, the vegetation for a number of other beetles and uh, bees and flies. We have a few listed here. Um, and in terms of birds, I really liked this quote from uh, exploringbirds.com, one of the best bird attracting plants in all of North America. So over 30 different species will, uh, will feed uh, on elderberries. A couple we have pictured here, the brown thrasher and rose-breasted grosbeak. And this is a pretty popular plant in general for wildlife. Uh, so I don't get into um, other um, groups of species uh, much beyond uh, birds and insects in most of these, but uh, in this case we have uh, a number of small mammals and even some reptiles that will make use of elderberry. Uh, up next, we have buttonbush. So I did try to throw in um, some native shrub options kind of for uh, a variety of, of situations. And buttonbush is one that prefers uh, full to partial sun and wet to moist, fertile, and high organic soil. So this would be a really good choice, for example, with a rain garden. 
or a, a wetter area in general, but I have seen them in, in relatively dry spots as well. Um, they'll just do a little bit better where, where the soils are moister. I just think these are just really um, interesting uh, in terms of their flower structure, you can see there. And then even into the fall and winter, uh, they re retain some of that structure and have those uh, little balls visible. So it has some winter interest. And it is host to uh, 24 butterflies and moths, including a couple here, the, the beautiful wood nymph and the common buckeye. Uh, this beautiful wood nymph that you see pictured there, um, I think really um, its name describes it quite well, but as I was doing some research, I saw that some, some people believe that it is actually mimicking a piece of bird poop. So uh, maybe not quite as beautiful wood nymph uh, if you take it that way. Uh, used by a number of different bees, wasps and flies as well. Uh, cuckoo bees, longhorn bees, and so on, and also a number of beetles and other larvae. Uh, actually, quite a few species uh, will use this that are uh, kind of specific, uh, host specific to buttonbush, such as this buttonbush uh, sphinx moth larvae. And uh, buttonbush also serves, uh, especially in wetlands, for uh, as a good food source for a number of wetland birds. And a couple of uh, bird species will occasionally nest in it. Uh, it can be poisonous to livestock, uh, so that might be a factor if you're in a more rural area. Um, but for some reason, I'm not sure how that works, beavers and white-tailed deer uh, are able to eat it occasionally. Uh, up next is the false indigo. It is a four to 16 foot tall shrub. It prefers the uh, full or partial sun and wet to moist conditions. And this is another one I've seen in uh, some fairly dry areas and it did quite all right in, in those areas as well. Uh, just might not flower as readily. Uh, it has this really dense flower arrangement that I find to be kind of interesting. And in the sunlight, the um, the tips of those flowers uh, almost have more of a metallic look to them. Uh, if you're familiar with um, prairie plants, uh, this is a, a relative of the lead plant, which has been, uh, the false indigo has been described as a lead plant on steroids. The lead plant is kind of a smaller version of this. Uh, the false indigo is host to up to 35 species of butterflies and moths and includes a number of different bees and also uh, a number of different uh, butterflies and, and moths as well. And it's used, the seeds are used, uh, eaten by a number of songbirds as well. So the goldfinch, white crowned sparrow, junco, and so on. Uh, up next, we have the fragrant sumac. So this one prefers full to partial sun, dry, sandy, or rocky soils, or music with fertile, loamy soil. This one, again, is, is pretty a generalist species, so it can, it can grow in a variety of places. It is two to eight feet tall, and it has a really nice smell, although you do want to be careful. Sometimes this one is mistaken for Poison ivy, if you look at that leaf shape, uh, you can see how some folks might get confused. Uh, generally, the leaves are not quite as large as, as the poison ivy leaves, and there are a few other uh, characteristics that would stick out. But if you do come across this and you're pretty sure you know what you, you're looking at, uh, break, a, break a leaf off and, and give it a smell. Uh, it is smaller and less aggressive than some of the other sumacs uh, that are out there, like smooth or, or staghorn sumac. But it does spread pretty readily, I will say. I've seen it uh, fill in some areas uh, pretty rapidly. Um, so Ruth, as a genus, is host to 49 species of butterflies and moths including a couple of pretty uh, stunning ones here. We have the regal moth, 
and the spring azure. And the fruits of fragrant sumac are not known to be um, a uh, significant food source of food, but uh, in some cases, um, when there's nothing else or little else left, uh, it will serve as uh, an emergency food source for, for some birds. Uh, and white-tailed deer and cottontail will also make use of fragrant, fragrant sumac. Uh, up next, we have spice bush. So this one prefers dappled sunlight to medium shade and moist to music and fertile loamy soil with organic matter. This is another one that has a, 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 a strong smell uh, when you crush the leaves. And I've seen where people have used it to even make a, a tea and to flavor ice cream with it. Something that I haven't tried yet, but uh, one of these days, I think I, think I will. Um, so it's not a host of as many uh, butterflies and moths uh, as some of the others. Whoops, jumped ahead. But um, rather famously, it is the host of the spice bush swallowtail. It has this really unique uh, caterpillar there with the large eye spots to fool predators into thinking it's a, a larger critter than it actually is. And another really um, interesting large insect here, the Promethea silk moth. In addition, uh, the fruits are eaten by quite a few different birds. Um, Eastern kingbird, great crested flycatcher, and hermit thrush are pictured here, among others. Up next, we have the rough leaf dogwood. Now, of course, we have a number of native dogwoods um, of various uh, shapes and sizes. This particular species is uh, a shrub or a small tree uh, up to about 20 feet tall. Uh, prefers partial sun and moist to slightly dry loam, clay loam, or rocky soils. So this one is um, rather adaptable has those kind of cool um, white berries uh, that I think are, are pretty interesting and then are also used by wildlife. Uh, so dogwoods as a genus are host to um, quite a few butterflies and moths. You can see 102 different species, uh, including this one that I, I found just kind of uh, unique, the funerary dagger moth. Um, just uh, kind of an interesting, unique creature there. Uh, in addition, um, these, when they're in bloom, you'll just see kind of swarms of, of pollinators around those flowers. So it's just kind of a, a fun one to watch in, in the spring when, when those are, are going. Uh, in addition to the pollinator species, there are also a number of predatory wasps uh, that'll make use of, of those other uh, insects that are visiting, and then a number of flies, butterflies, skippers, and beetles. And as I mentioned, over 20 uh, species of birds will feed on those white fruits, uh, including uh, some of our game species, Bob White, wild turkey, but also songbirds, purple finch, evening grosbeak, and pine warbler, as pictured there. Um, up next, we have the uh, hearts of Boston, Euonymus americanus. Uh, this one has a number of different um, uh, aliases, uh, one of them being strawberry bush. Uh, you can see from the, um, the fruiting body there, that's the uh, source of the Hearts of Boston name and probably the most unique feature of this plant. Um, there are a, a few different uh, euonymus species some of which are native, such as this one, and some of which are uh, some of our worst invasive exotic species. So uh, that is something you're gonna wanna 
look out for if you're considering using a uh, Euonymus at one of your sites. Um, it does have these rather nondescript uh, pale green flowers there. You can see in the bottom right, bright green oval leaves that become dark red in the fall, hence the burning bush name. Um, most of the species in this genus will will uh, turn that uh, dark bright red in the fall. And then, of course, these these uh, fruits uh, that are are very attractive. It does prefer light shade and moist soil um, and can tolerate full shade, but this one uh, would not do as well in full sun. And I did just want to share with you, this was a, an advertisement that I came across uh, for this plant online and uh, uh, AKA deer candy ice cream plant for deer. <laughs> Uh, so that's something you want to take into account uh, if you do have uh, a deer, heavy deer population. This one might not um, make it too long, or you might have to fence it off if it's something that you want uh, to have in your in your spot. Uh, it uh, native euonymus are hosts to uh, 14 different butterflies and moths. Um, we have pictured here the white marked tussock moth, cecropia silk moth, current clear wing, and so on. And the berries are eaten by a number of birds. Uh, we have pictured here an eastern towhee, also northern flickers, brown thrashers, catbirds, eastern bluebirds, and so on. Uh, up next, we have the nine bark. So this one is three to nine feet tall. This one uh, prefers full to partial sunlight, moist to dry, loamy, sandy, or rocky soil. So this one is, again, pretty adaptable. Um, it does provide a nectar, pollen, and seed resource for wildlife. Nine bark is host to 30 different species of butterflies and moths. Pictured here, we have the Io moth, also blinded sphinx, Cecropia silk moth, nine bark pygmy moth, raspberry leaf roller, and unicorn caterpillar. Some pretty unique names there. Whoop. And up next, we have the American hazelnut. Uh, this one is four to 15 feet tall. Prefers full sun to light shade, moist to dry, music, loamy, sandy, or rocky soil. Again, pretty adaptable species. This one has a very high wildlife value as well. Host to 113 butterflies and moss, so a pretty significant number there. Uh, one highlight of, of which we have here is the royal walnut moth, also known as the hickory horn devil. Uh, so again, another host plant of this are, are hickory trees. Pretty scary looking one right there. The nuts themselves uh, are eaten by a number of birds, Bob White, wild turkey, greater prairie chicken in the right spot. Uh, Red-bellied woodpecker and blue jay, so some of our larger birds are able to uh, eat those hazelnuts. They're about the size of an acorn. Uh, the catkins, um, if you missed those from that first slide, they provide a food source in the winter. These are also used by a number of mammals. Of course, squirrels and, and other uh, small mammals uh, readily eat those nuts. Uh, beavers will eat the stems and use the stems to construct lodges. And uh, this one is known to provide cover and, and ideal nesting habitat for a number of songbirds as well. Um, so in the talk, I did want to bring up uh, Illinois native evergreen shrub. So pretty much everything that we've talked about uh, so far are deciduous shrubs. 
And unfortunately, there are not many uh, native evergreen shrub options uh, in Illinois. In Northern Illinois, we of course have the Canada U, and there are a number of non-native U's that are, are frequently used in landscaping as well. Um, you do wanna be careful, uh, they can be toxic uh, if you do decide to use some of those. Um, a couple of shrubs that are native to uh, nearby regions, the mountain laurel and the inkberry, um, I believe those are native just to our east and southeast, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I, I do believe they do all right uh, throughout Illinois. And um, there are a couple of options if uh, you want some evergreen uh, for certain purposes in the landscape, but shrubs if they're not necessarily if they don't necessarily need to be shrubs there are a couple of different options for native plants um, so the giant reed or our um, native cane species uh, would be a good option in, in some cases that would uh, make a nice screen in some instances uh, you do need to be careful with that one there is um, a non-native uh, invasive grass, uh, giant cane known as Arundo donax. So you wanna avoid that one. Uh, there are a few native evergreen trees that could be options depending on the site. So Eastern red cedar, uh, short leaf pine and American holly. And then, uh, if you're just looking for some green interest over the winter, possibly the Christmas fern could, could be a good choice for, for something like that. Um, you do want to be aware of some pitfalls. So um, of course, as probably most of us know, there are uh, quite a few non-native invasive plants that are, are still heavily promoted. Um, burning bush, calorie pear, such as Bradford pear, aristocrat, any number of those ornamental pear varieties, pretty much if they're an ornamental pear, they're most likely the calorie pear species and uh, are potentially invasive. In Southern Illinois, we've had a couple um, down here that have been problematic to our South, but are now starting to show up. A couple of things like leatherleaf mahonia, heavenly bamboo, or nandina, which I've unfortunately seen uh, a fair amount of um, coming into our area into landscaping, and it can be a huge problem. Um, in Arkansas, in particular, I've seen pretty large stands of the nandina, and that, in addition to being an invasive on the landscape, it also uh, is poisonous to songbirds. And there have been instances where uh, quite a few uh, songbirds have been uh, eating those fruits and, and dying off. Uh, Japanese barberry is one that's uh, still heavily promoted across the state and, and can be a problem. Um, there's at least one instance where um, a plant sold under one name, species name, uh, is actually a different invasive species. So there was a study uh, a few years back that found uh, a little over half of plants labeled as American bittersweet were actually oriental bittersweet, uh, which is unfortunate. It's pretty difficult to tell those two apart until they mature a little bit and um, you can uh, determine the species a little better by their flower position and, and position of their fruits. So that's something you might want to look out for. Um, also, you do want to look out for the uh, common names. So there are actually a number of, of non-native uh, species um, and native species that have either very similar or the same common names. So burning bush, like you mentioned before, that's uh, in the Euonymus genus. So it's the same genus as some native plants like the strawberry bush or the uh, Eastern Wahoo is another native that is uh, in the Euonymus genus. 
Um, but you want to watch out for that. I know there's kind of a similar story with some dogwoods that are uh, non-native and, and a few others as well. So it's just something to look out for. And um, I just wanted to list here at the end some of the uh, references that I used um, for the talk.